with the prayer for priest. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty, eternal God, look upon the face of Christ, and for the love of him, who is the eternal high priest, have mercy on your priests. Remember, O most compassionate God, that they are but weak and frail human beings. Stir up in them the grace of their vocation, which is bestowed on them by the imposition of the bish hands. Keep them close to you, lest the enemy prevail against them, so that they may never do anything in the slightest degree unworthy of the sublime vocation. O oh Jesus, I pray for your faithful and fervent priests, for your unfaithful and tepid priests, for your priests laboring at home or abroad, in distant mission fields, for your tempted priests, for your lonely priests, for your young priests, for your aged priests, for your sick priests, for your dying priests, for the souls of your priests in purgatory. But above all, I recommend to you the priest dearest to me, the priest who baptized me, the priest who absolved me from my sins, the priest as who masses I assisted, and who gave me your body and blood in Holy Communion, the priest who taught and instructed me, or helped me and encouraged me, or the priest to whom I am indebted in any other way, Okay. Particularly, let us pray for our Holy Father, our local bishops and pastors, and all the Papa priests. O oh, Jesus, keep them close to your sacred heart, and bless them abundantly in time and eternity. Amen. O oh, Mary Queen of the Apostles, make your priests holy. O oh, Mary Queen of the Apostles, make your priests holy. O oh, Mary Queen of the Apostles, make, make, make your priests holy. Saint John Vianney, pray, pray for us. Saint Alphonse, pray, pray for, for us. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us go straight to the the gospel. Okay, I'll read the gospel and I'm gonna summarize everything for you. Right. And uh, the um. The format is very simple. I'll read the gospel. I have a review, a short review of the readings. And then each of us will share um, the point okay, uh, you got from your homily, from the homily you attended uh, on TV or at church, whatever. Uh, the point of sharing the what, the question, what is it, is to share the knowledge, not your understanding. Okay. First, share the point. Okay, what is the point? Maybe one sentence or maybe one word is okay. Okay, the point is life. The point is resurrection, whatever. One point, okay? And then the so what is your understanding, the relevance, okay? How it's pertinent to you, okay? So make sure that we do that. It's easier that way, okay? Uh, the so what is, you can explain. It's just an explanation of so what. Um, now what? We do not need to share that uh, you're going to use it for yourself, more reflection, whatever you do, you apply it to, uh, to your own life, okay? So three, the, uh, the threefold what question, what is it, so what, and now what, okay? So we're going to share only two, two folds of the what question, what and so what, okay? So I'm going to read the, the Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 to 20. This is supposed to be the end, isn't it, of the... Um, no, it's, uh, oh yeah, the end. This is the end of um, the gospel according to Matthew. Okay, so you know the context. It is the end of uh, Matthew. Okay. This is the conclusion, uh, closing. Okay, and we'll move, move. We're moving on to another, another gospel. Okay, all the all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus has ordered them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. Then Jesus approached and said to them, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. 
and behold, I am with you always until the end of time of, of the age. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Okay. So um, let's review. In the liturgy of the word, we can do the liturgy of the word outside the map. This is the liturgy of the word, okay? So now, first point. Whenever, whenever we gather or where, whenever we assemble, okay? And this, um, the right to assemble for any reason, political reason, financial reason, gathering assembly for church, for worship, it is protected by the Constitution of the U.S. of A. Is that true or not? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay. So whenever you, you, the point is to gather, right? You gather together and we have to have a mission for the gathering. So whenever you assemble, you gather a meeting, okay, a rendezvous, uh, either uh, you, uh, you do something, okay, it's about doing something. You have to have a point to do something, okay? Either you could um, do something, okay? Learn something or make something. So the mission is very important. When you see this Zoom ZBS, the point is to study, okay? This is what we do. We study, and so we're going to focus on study in the many ways to study reading and sharing and discussing right and you can have reflection those are for studying so what whatever this is about papa so whenever you do something there's a whole um art of uh, organization when you organize for a meeting you have to have a mission or a goal the goal here is to study so that's why we say zbs okay zoom bible study okay nothing else okay we will not we will not distract ourselves from the word study okay okay that's number one you could um, gather to eat to celebrate okay you do that and okay? we have a party birthday party you do that okay or anniversary you do that okay after mass you do that you could have a uh, a meeting to discuss something to organize something okay to do something to have a revolution you do that but here we the point is every assemble or every gathering we have to have a point what do you do and everybody's going to focus on that point okay so we focus on the point of studying and in order to study we have to have an object for study okay the object is the bible you have the word study bible study and the bible is a book and the book has too many things to study you know? to take away from, to draw from. So we focus on the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the word is the, God, the, the reading, um, the liturgy of the word from the, the past Sunday, not the next, okay? So why do I do this? Why do we do this? Why should we do this? It is because hindsight is always twenty twenty. I don't think people prepare enough to go to church and the majority, unless you're good to do you know, Mary Cho or Naomi or, or some people, you're teachers. So you prepare yourself. And you, since you're the readers, the lectors, and the, the catechists, you prepare. I guarantee you the majority of Catholics, they don't prepare for the next Mass or the Pentecost. Okay? And after Mass, they go home. I don't think people would get one point. And they, they are immediately after Mass, you go out for lunch. And by evening, you forgot about what priest taught and even when you pay attention close attention to the priest many a times the priest make too many points to remember unless you purposely purposely okay make it a point to remember to to connect or to retain okay and some of the points and uh, some some of the points sometimes they are interesting and it picks your interest and it it, uh, it encourages you it excites you and encourages you to study more. Most of the time, no. Okay, most of the time, the, uh, the homily, um, as, as I see it, even including in my homily, I don't think people pay attention, okay? Unless you, you, you go after the people and ask, what was it, what is the point? Or you make it clear, okay? So this is the reason we have this, Bible study. So we take what already has been given in the, the past Sunday, and you take uh, you take time together 
is getting to study what we already studied or listened to or remembered. And then you do your own research as well because from Sunday to Wednesday, there are three days already. They have time to further reflection, okay? So let's review a little bit. And that means you already read it, you already um, prepared it, and you study with me, okay? So after the apostle, chapter one, okay, the beginning of Acts and the end of Matthew. The end of Matthew is the beginning of Acts. The end of Luke is the beginning of Acts, okay? The end of Mark is the beginning of Acts. John is different. John is very different, okay? John has a, a different scenario when you study John. John is unlike synoptic, okay? Synoptic, uh, syn means together, synthesize, okay? Together, optic means you see the same vision. Optic, the option, you know, optic the eyes, okay? So you see with the same vision, the same worldview. So synoptic, we have three, right? Uh, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. John is different. I'm gonna give you, this is Bible study, kind of a context for you. I, I give you the context of the Bible. When you, you study the Bible, you understand that the synoptics are talking about the, um, the end is all about the humiliation of the Christ, the persecution, execution, okay, the passion of the Christ. We are more focusing on, you know, the human part, the earthly, the human part of Jesus Christ. And then you have, you have resurrection. But when you look at John, John almost as if he never mentioned about the uh, institution of the Eucharist. Okay, he um, he had John chapter six. It's about already and already done. So when you read John, put this in mind. Keep this in mind. John is about the sanctification. You know, crucifixion, death, and burial and resurrection, all of those is all about the sanctification, the glorification, okay? Consecration of Jesus Christ. So when you reach on, it's already in heaven, okay? Does that make sense to anybody? I'll give you the context. When you read in the proper context, you understand it that way, okay? So uh, you try to find some kind of uh, um, like a pietistic, pietistic, um, spirituality from John, you may, uh, like devotional, uh, you may get into trouble because John, most of all, most of the time, he is about um, Jesus speaking to himself. Many, many of his monologue, okay? Like he talked to himself, he talked to the Father as if, so he let the apostles listen in, okay? He was talking, monologuing with God the Father and and then uh, the apostles interfere, intervenes, and what are you talking about, okay? So when you read John, because John had um, uh, almost six, uh, 40 years of uh, reflection. So it was a reflection of what he went through long ago, like one generation ago, okay? So now we're gonna go back to the, uh, the first reading, Acts of the Apostle, all right? So now is th this is uh, the closing uh, kind of a review of what uh, the first volume of Luke, okay? The first volume was the Gospel of Luke. And he reviewed, he, he began with the end of the Gospel of Luke. And you know it, okay? It is basically um, the summary of the uh, message of salvation, okay? It's a witness always when you give a summary, a message of salvation is always giving a witness. And the point of uh, St. Luke was always about evangelization. Evangelization is giving witness, testimony, in writing, in a letter to his boss, the patron who paid for his research, okay? And you know his name, Theophilus, okay? Right? And so he reviewed, and you know, I have a review of everything and you know what that is. Okay. And uh, one of the things he was introducing to Theophilus, a new thing at the end, but then he put something new in it. It is the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read you to you uh, this part, okay? Uh, in the first book, or first volume, Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus did, taught, did, taught, until the day he 
was taken up, did Todd taken up after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostle whom he had chosen. So he introduced the Holy Spirit. That is, that is the new factor, new factor, okay? Uh, the first book, first volume, is about, all about Jesus and the power of Jesus. Now you see the Holy Spirit, and we are preparing for the coming of the Holy Spirit. 40 days, and we're again number 40, okay? And then that's it. See, the whole point is preparation for the Holy Spirit, all right? Now, the second one, second reading is the Psalms, always the Psalms, okay? All right? It's um, God mounts on his throne to shout for joy. Once again, the theme is joy, but this is a clarification of Jesus Christ. Resurrection, but more than the resurrection. Resurrection, and you have to have the ascension. He ascended into, you know, the, um, he goes back to his father's house and went into the right hand of God the Father. And glorification, that's the psalm, okay? And then you have the second reading, Ephesians. Uh, no, uh, note this. Ephesian is a community, a church of the priests, a lot of Jewish priests, okay? And so um, that means Paul had to write in the language, the theological language, Judaic, okay? Uh, priestly language, okay? And he convinced, somehow he convinced, uh, he, he convinced these priests, a lot of priests, Elders, they call the elders. And so when he wrote, understand that he wrote to, to these intellectuals, those who know the Bible, okay, the, the Hebrew Bible, we call it the Old Testament. Okay? And he gave them something really new, something they have been hoping for for a long time. And so um, he gave them Jesus. He gave them the message of salvation. Once again, uh, it's, it's not unlike Luke. Luke was the disciple of Paul. And so Paul always evangelized by giving personal testimony, but very, very well thought out testimony and uh, Bible based or Torah based. Okay? So you see his disciples, Luke did the same thing. Paul, what Paul did for the Hebrews, okay, for the Jews in Ephesus and other other community look did the same for did the same thing for the Romans and the Greeks. Okay, so you see the continuation of uh, continuation of um, uh, of the spirit. Okay, so it's it's all about that. Okay, now I'm gonna stop there, and uh, I'll I will invite you now to share the uh, what the what and the so what, right? And then we get into the gospel. Okay, please go to it. It was by Bishop Barron. And um, Bishop Barron went really deep and he caused me a bit of confusion because he started off talking about the readings from a liturgical and a political perspective. Okay. So I had to struggle a little bit. So it caused me to go and do some studying on my own. Mm -hmm. um, so what I came up with as the what is that um, that Jesus is um, in in his ascension, Jesus is uh, being declared or is becoming a sovereign authority, which means that he has the power uh, uh, over all over the realms of heaven and earth, and um, so um, as he escalates into the presence of God the power is given to him. And also in that what is, is being invested with this power, he confers, Jesus confers a missionary mandate on his disciples and to all of us uh, in this uh, small chapter, because it's all about the Great Commission. And the, the mm. so what for me is that, well, now that this has been declared, evangelization is now not just restricted to the Jews of the house of Israel, but it's being expanded to all of us, to all of the apostles, the Gentiles, and ultimately to us. And mm -hmm. also um, the so what is that a disciple has to listen and learn from Jesus and live in imitation of Jesus's life so that um, 
so that discipleship can take place. Okay, now this is your take or Bishop Baron take? Well, I, that's where that, that so what it was my take because uh, as Bishop Baron talked a lot about, um, he talked a lot about the power of God. Um, you know, God was the, uh, and the Father were direct uh, heads of the church and that what he, oh, I'm sorry. What he did is um, when he gave that power, um, he went all into the cross and Jesus's death and that, um, that Jesus's death was this great act of um, sacrifice that was related to the temple sacrifice. And it just got a little too deep for me and I kind of got lost in it. And I, you know, so, um, mm -hmm. uh, but he, he built everything upon Jesus being given that power uh, over time and space and over the realms of heaven and earth and, and drawing in, in the midst of declaring that power, um, then the disciple, discipleship was really extended beyond the people of Israel. So um, um, he even talked about Jesus had assumed the priesthood of Melchizedek, and he went on to explain how that, uh, you know, as king and as priest, and he went into a lot of explanation as to how those things came together through Jesus, and, you know, that, uh, so I kind of, like I said, I kind of got lost in some of it. Yeah, I, I got lost also. <laughs> so I went from too much, my commentary too much. on the gospel okay, of Matthew. <laughs> it's, it's quite a lot, you know. The, yeah, the reading you, you you read the reading and how count how many now look at how many sentences or how many verses. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, five verses. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot, it's powerful, it's compact, right? Yeah. And then you get into all those. When you talk about you focus on power, you focus on politics. You understand <laughs> that? Yeah. And uh, you understand that Bishop Barron is here in Los Angeles. Yeah. Like he's in my archdiocese. And um, it's a very socialistic. It's a political agenda. So everything, it's a kind of a, a, there is a, a slight kind of touch of uh, politics in it. Okay. So when you get into politics, it's going to be confusing. Right. But uh, the, so the point is taken and appreciated. Eh? So thank you, Gertrude, for your uh, your study, your research, your reflection, your explanation. Very good. Thank you. Let's move on. When we move to, could we move to Olivia, Doctor Olivia? Thank you. I, I. Good afternoon, Father. And my take was that um, this is the Paschal mystery. So you have the suffering, death of Jesus, the resurrection, the ascension, and then Pentecost. In the ascension, Jesus is leaving earth to enter into his glory. He's sharing his glory with his father. And Jesus now reigns over all uh, of creation. And he leaves us with a great commission. He leaves us with instructions of, of what to do, baptize, teach, save, speak. And that, uh, and that was the what. And then the so what for me and what I understood was that he won't leave us alone that he um, has uh, all the force of, of heaven with him, um, the Holy Spirit, and that um, he won't leave us alone. That's a problem. If somebody doesn't give you a leave, leave you alone, you'll be in trouble. <laughs> okay. Oh, I know that for sure, Father. <laughs> I, I, I can't go anywhere without a different somebody. Way. I took it from a different sense, okay? Hi, thank you, Olivia, Mary Jo. Okay, Bishop Strickland, uh, his what was when Jesus ascended, as he was ascending, they saw him, they worshiped him, meaning the disciples, but they doubted. And so then he goes into that, Jesus assures us through his words that from that he has been given power from the Father, all power of heaven and earth, and that he will never leave us, that he will 
be with us always. But through our worship, he will uh, encourage us and that uh, he will also give the send his power to his disciples who in turn will it will filter down to all believers and that we will go and make disciples of all nations. So um, thank you, Mary Jo. See the point of um, two bishops, Bishop Berendt and Bishop Strickland, is all ecclesiology, ecclesial. Mm -hmm. So this is about church and expanding the church, right? So that's how they take it. always apostles, sending out, make disciples, so it makes sense that they have, that's how they interpret it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to Bishop uh, Joseph Strickland, <laughs> Bishop Barron, and all of you, Mary Jo, okay? And point taken. Thank you. Now let's move to down to the south, down under to Australia, <laughs> Gold Coast of Brisbane. And what did you get? What do you get from the the readings or from the, the homily? Oh, um, the homily I attended was Archbishop Andrew Fisher, Archdiocese of Sydney. Um, I have a lot of questions. Okay. Point and first, then, question second. Okay, point first. So, um, what, is it? what was, why do we feel nostalgia for heaven? They mentioned about why, why do we always keep looking up. Okay. So he right. focused on why are we always looking to heaven heaven yeah. and the so what was um had a lot of examples of how we look up to heaven but um one that i remember was um if the magi kept looking upwards they would have not seen the child jesus below okay so so what what yeah. is the what is the last point? Uh, they looked up into heaven. The magi. If the magi and kept looking upwards, they would have yeah. not seen the child Jesus below. Okay, all right, all right. Very good, good point. So I thought that if I got confused there, because <laughs> I thought that we're not supposed to look up to heaven, but then I thought that. Um, we, sh we shouldn't focus on it. So that's where I got confused. Really okay. confused. What it's a good confusion, is. healthy confusion. Yeah. I thought that we're supposed to be looking towards home, but it sounded like we're not. Okay. So, the now, so the now what was, um, don't pretty much look where Jesus is. He could be in heaven, he could be on earth, he could be in front of us. So focus on where he is, not always looking out, going home to heaven. Oh, okay. That is intriguing, okay? That's a very, very interesting take on this, okay? Thank you. It's, uh, it takes us back to uh, the bishop. Archbishop takes us back to the incarnation, Christmas. Huh? His connection between Ascension and uh, the Magi, okay? To the, uh, the mystery of the incarnation. We will we, we'll discuss on that. We'll take that point later on. Click on it later on. Okay. Thank you, Anne. And Maria. <laughs> All right. So this was a homily by Father Christopher Plant. Um, okay. He actually used a lot of your techniques, I think. And his homilies are very good. He always ties the first reading, he ties all the readings into his homily, explaining back and forth. Okay. So then the what, that's the what, it's like he's talking about when the uh, apostles of, what are we supposed to be doing, right? So tell, Jesus sends the Great Commission. So how mm -hmm. he ties the Great Commission between the two readings, Acts and Matthew. So the big question is, um, the apostle says, well, so when are you, when are you putting the kingdom of God? When is, when are you restoring kingdom to Israel? And Jesus like, none, you know, <laughs> it's not for you to know time and seasons. In fact, but it wasn't a see you later. 
type of thing. So he goes, but Father went back to ask, it's not for you to know, but you will receive the power from on high, the Holy Spirit. Going back to Matthew is, I am with you until the end of age. So, and then Father explains how we're going to get, how we use the whole, how will the Holy Spirit be with us? Okay. Um, in, four, four, in four ways, by praying. Okay. By learning. So praying through the sacraments, the sacraments are established by Jesus. The Holy Spirit help us persevere in prayer through the sacraments. In learning, the Holy Spirit's in the learning about the faith enriches our minds and soul. Mm -hmm. So don't fill our minds with junk and immorality. And witnessing, he put witnessing before, before teaching. But witnessing is the so what and now what. So I'm gonna skip it. Teaching, teaching, we teach through our witnessing everybody. Mm -hmm. So the that was what so the the so what is will be the witnessing part, and then that's what struck me. The Christianity, the father said Christianity is not an esoteric key for our salvation. So we have to make a decision to be Christian everywhere, all the time. It's not a theory. It's not esoteric. It's not esoteric. It's not something that I use to live my life better. But it's the life. It is who I am with real world consequences. And so he went on to talk about how the Holy Spirit will talk, work with us for the conversion of others and how we will be a witness. And well, I'll say you then, now what? Because it had it ties really good. That the now what is, we have to thank God we don't know everything. We don't know the times and the seasons, the futures. Because through the Holy Spirit, we have something better. We can rejoice that we're part of the time of the seasons on this adventure of not knowing, not on this adventure, not knowing, we do not know the way. We know Jesus who is the way. The Holy Spirit guides us on the way and the Father to whom the way is leading us to. Okay. So I was like, wow. I was like, never thought on, on any of these things. So that's okay. very good. That's a, <laughs> All right. That's a lot of things. That's a lot of things. That was a lot. I had to go back and watch the video like four times. <laughs> okay. Very good. All right. Thank you. Father, what is his name? Christopher Plant. Okay, Christopher. Thank you for the Christopher plant. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank God for the priests and the bishops. Okay. And the deacons. All right. So thank you. Let's move on to Miss Italy. Italia. Italiana. Uh, Siciliana. <coughs> From <Okay>. Italy. <laughs> Richmond, uh, Italy. I, uh, <clears throat> I heard Deacon Don's, um, message Sunday, but also watched um, on EWT and Father Marks. And he, okay. he, he was very good, but he like Bishop, uh, whatever uh, that Gertrude went to, he got a little political and I, I thought it was kind of fascinating, but he, he talked about, he read the Ephesians, the second reading, and then he, he started talking about the entrance into heaven and that um, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And this is a vital teaching because God is sovereign. He kept uh, talking about that, that God is sovereign. And then he, he has authority over all things and God's rightful place over the world and the angels. And, and um, this witness is continually needed in history. So then he gets <clears throat> a bit political, I thought, but I thought it was interesting. He said that um, God is sovereign. He kept saying that over and over and um, more powerful than anything. If he is not accepted as sovereign, we see that in our history, man loses freedom and dignity and his fulfillment. And if we put something else in that chair, of authority in our life, we are the losers. 
if he's not recognized as sovereign, we are the ones that are diminished and we're the ones that um, lose the true sense of, of our, the nature and calling. Uh, then it, he even, it, he cited the, in recent hint history, um, the government or state elevated um, over the person of, of God and um, said what the state government dictates uh, as right or wrong in moral co uh, compass for the people. And he mentioned China and he mentioned, you know, the two child policy and then it went to the one child policy and then, mm -hmm. uh, and all that. And he, I mean, I thought that was pretty interesting, but, and he even mentioned the West, we, as far as abortion is raging. And um, so, um, we have to separate the truth from freedom, from morality, he said. And it, um, it, 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 was, it was very interesting, but I, I, I'm not answering your questions of what and all that stuff, but, um, but I, um, um, you know, I just, it, he, he stressed how vital it is for everyone to realize that God is sovereign and powerful and we should, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, and he, he, of course he talked about other things too, but um, let's see, I wrote all this stuff down and I can't find it. But it, it um, um, he, you know, he, um, He was, he was a, you know, it was a very good homily. It's just, that's what I took from it, so. Thank you. Thank you for taking it and sharing it, okay? Uh, you sound like Texan more than Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Anne and this uh, genuine uh, Aussie Australian. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we have the gospel, the readings, the liturgy of the word from different perspectives, right? It could be from the pastoral perspective, from the evangelical perspective, from the, um, the um, uh, political perspective, we're taking that. Or we could take it um, um, from the spiritual, really the spiritual perspective. Now, what I want to get uh, into with you is to focus on the biblical, biblical perspective, right? So when you are in church, it's supposed to be either political or pastoral and sometimes financial. Yeah? So when, when, when you think that way, you think Catholic, you think normally in the sense of, okay, is it, does this involve with doing some kind of uh, charitable, work, charitable work, pastoral work, okay? And going apply to your family life. But when you talk about biblical, we're talking about historical, cultural, and very personal. But personal in the sense of Jesus and the apostles. And so we have to understand where he was coming from and what it meant before you could apply into your life and reflect on what it means for you in today's you know, uh, setting. So now let's return to the gospel. Okay. I will touch a little bit here and there and then explain to you. Now um, let's envision or imagine. Okay. The context was 40 days. You hear that in the, uh, the, the Acts of the Apostles. Remember? The church purposely put the se in the second reading, again, the first reading, the Acts of the Apostles, 40 days, right? So Luke was writing the, the gospel according to Luke. And then uh, he took a break. He wrote the second, right, the second volume, the Acts, of the, the Acts of the Apostles, right? So that means there is a period of 40 days. And he begins with this uh, reviewing 
of what happened during the very first days, okay? The passion, the burial, the resurrection, and then he begins with the 40th day, what the events uh, occurred in the 40 days. Number one, you put the gospel in that context as well, okay? All right? And St. Chen Paul in that context as well, Ephesians, okay? So first of all, number 40, do you recall what the number 40 means? One word, it is in the Papa Handbook, very important. In order to do something, you need to start with a P and there are five P's, right? We need to make uh, pea soups or something, the P's. And the number 40, it really equates, it's, it's synonymous with the, the word P, all right? And um, it is important to, to understand this, this concept, okay, the 40. You know it already. Um, Moses was on the mountaintop, okay, for 40 days, 40 nights. Elijah was in the desert for 40 days, 40 nights, right? Jesus was in the desert 40 days, 40 nights. Remember? All right? All right? And now we have 40, day, 40 days. And the Israelites was in the, uh, in the desert for 40 years. Okay? So before we get into the text, the gospel text, we have to take into consideration the 40. What do you do in the 40 days? Well, the, the Lord wants something. The Lord wants to achieve something, want to do something. Before he does it, he prepares the people to do it. Okay? So whenever you think about number 40, think about the word P4, which stands for preparation. Okay? Now, on the mountaintop Sinai, I remember how many days uh, for the flood, Noah, Noah's flood? 40 days. Yeah. So what was he preparing? Okay. It was a recreation of humankind. Mm -hmm. He washed it with the water, like baptism, right? So he washing, mm -hmm. baptizing, and he prepares for a second kind of uh, humanity because the first one was too corrupt. He wiped out, right? Preparation, right? For a new earth, a new humanity. Moses was on the mountain top. 40 days, 40 nights. What was he preparing? The Ten Commandments. Yeah, to receive the revealed, the divinely revealed teaching, a law. Basically, it's all about the law. See, the Exodus... Remember, the Exodus is all about prepare, uh, preparing the, the Israelites to receive the law. Okay? It's called the Torah. Now we say the Ten Commandments, and there are more than Ten Commandments. Okay? 613. Okay? And then you add with the Noahide laws, commandments, it, it adds up to... Um, it, uh, it adds up to uh, 620. Okay? So now I, I'll go back to the context for you, okay? Uh, to the context of the book of Genesis. So God created humankind, man, woman, female, male and female, Adam and Eve, okay? And as we know, okay, he gave everything to Adam and Eve to be in charge, to name them, to use them, okay? Not to abuse them, okay? All the power, he could do anything. But still, he said, okay, there is a tree. I forbid you to eat from the, uh, the fruits from this tree, the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil. Okay? And he even gave them the freedom to choose whether to eat it or not to eat it. He said, don't eat it. But he, he gives them the free, free will to choose, isn't it? Right? He said, don't eat it. But here it is. So was it a trick question? No, no. You, you give the freedom and you give the fruit. Huh. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what they did, right? Mm -hmm. They make a choice, okay? They make the choice to know, mm -hmm. okay? We say they make a choice to commit sins. 
but uh, for for the you know for the the Jews, they say they make the choice to know. Okay, they make the choice. It's about the choice. Okay, but then once you break, you know, you you open the can of worm and and you eat it. There's no stopping. What happened was corruption. Death means corruption. The ultimate corruption is death, right? And they they cannot control themselves anymore because you know the explosion of the the information age, right? Technology. You cannot stop information. You cannot stop knowledge. It's not. It's no longer about power. It's about knowledge. Knowledge is power. But human being is unable. We are unable to stop knowledge. And there seems to be a lot of false knowledge and evil knowledge. Okay, evil science. Okay, even science. There's such kind of a evil science. Okay, science to kill people. Science how to destroy human lives, like uh, creating bombs or chemical weapons, or how to cut the babies into pieces. There's a kind of an art, and there's a saying that there are more. There are more arts to teach people how to kill. Thousands of ways to kill, then then we learn how to save lives. Okay, so God put a stop in this kind of explosion of knowledge, when the 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 eating of the forbidden fruit was the explosion of knowledge, good and evil, right? So God put a stop in it, and so He gave us this kind of tool, the inherent in the, the inherent tool, He places it in the psyche the soul of the human being the first law which is the conscience he gave us a conscience to say no 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 wrong 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 evil wicked bad no i say so the moment adam and eve ate the forbidden fruit knowledge of good and evil they know they want to know still and then suddenly shame oh i see me myself naked and i see you naked shame they hide themselves that's the voice of the conscience. They know it's wrong, but the conscience is very, very weak. Okay. Well, you do this, you're gonna suffer, right? And first of all, shame in your shame on me, and then you make other people suffer. Still, knowledge is very tempting. Knowledge is power. I know more about you. I can control you. I can manipulate. Right. So after they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, more evil first Cain and Abel, isn't it? Remember, envy and all those things, and then just uh, the explosion of evil, corruption, the evil, more and more killing and killing, seven times, seventy times seven, not forgiving, and you know. Um, so Lamech said to his two wives, you know, Cain was forgiven seven times. I'm gonna revenge seventy times seven. Mm -hmm. And to the point that this, you know, the Lord could not take, the world could not take evil anymore. So second creation of human humanity, the flood 40 days for unite, cleansing, preparing for the new, for the new um, humanity, right? And at that time, God gave Noah seven laws. First law was the conscience, but that law was not good enough. That the conscience was not strong enough. So you have the seven laws of Noah. I, I think, I don't know if any one of you ever heard of it, the seven Noahide laws yeah. before you have the 10 commandments. Well, of course, first of all, they worship too many gods. So you shall worship only one God, no idolatry, like no murder, well, king and you know, the people, like you no, know, um, don't live like an animal. There's a law say don't live like an animal. So that means, uh, what does it mean to live like an animal? Okay, incests, right? Uh, brothers and sisters and living with animals and all those terrible things. Living like right now, society will live like animals. You are human, you're not animals. Don't live like animals, right? And don't steal, don't cheat, all those things, okay? And uh, um, so I, I'll list for you, okay, later on. You, you go research on no high plots, okay? But that was not even good enough. Okay. So they built the tower of bubbling. We call it bubbling, <laughs> bubble. Bubbling. Okay. So there's a confusion like Gertrude uh, listening to the bishops preaching on politics. 
it confuses people. <laughs> so you know what babbling is, you know what confusion is, listen to politics. And we would say, I'm right. Huh? And they prove it with their own experts. And everybody becomes an expert, paleologist pan pan or whatever, a pandan, you know, so everybody is a doctor. So very confusing, right? So he prepared, the Lord gave us a third time, another law. You know, and this time is no longer universal. It's particular, the no us uh, laws was for everybody. Of course, no stealing, no lying, no killing, right? But this time he chose not one family, a one person like Noah, he chose the whole nation. He picked, you know, he particularly picked Israel, Jacob. Okay, he gave this law, he made this people, the people of priests, okay? Priestly people to keep this law, the 10 commandments. Okay, very clear, okay? So you see that 40 days for preparation, right? Always for preparation. Uh, to get rid of something, cleanse something, baptize something, and then for a new thing. But the new thing, whether you like it or not, is another thing okay, coming. Whether you commit your life, you devote your life to that, is another thing. Okay. So now in that context, you see the 40 days Jesus was in the desert preparing for evangelization. The kingdom of God at, is at hand, right? Okay. So now, at the end of his life on earth, okay, he's still alive, he's still with us, but you know, the... Uh, the human life, um, the historical, historical Jesus. Um, so you see 40 days, he spent 40 days with the apostles, the disciples. As the reason Lord, the reason Lord, okay? Now there's a question for you, we get to the scripture. What was he preparing? What he's, was he preparing the disciples for? We need to read in that biblical context, historical context. Well, he was preparing for them for two things. He was preparing for them for his absence. Okay? And he was preparing them for his new way of presence. Physical absence but spiritual presence. Okay? And this, this is shocking. They, um, they lost him. They thought they were, they have lost him forever. Okay? He was there, entering into Jerusalem. People wanted to make him king. He was the most powerful of all the prophets and the teacher. And suddenly, one week later, he got prosecuted, Okay, humiliated, executed, killed, buried. They lost him forever. And then he came back. Then he said, you're going to lose me again. Just like before, he told me, you know, in three days or something. And then the, the third day, um, you know, the, the priest and the, the elders going to capture me and kill me and all those things. And they were worried before. And it happened. And then he came back and he said, you're going to lose me again. See? Unsettling, isn't it? Now, the problem was this. Everything within this 40 days or this day of, uh, of Easter, the resurrection, is mind-blowing. Now you cannot imagine it. You cannot feel it because we, we take it from a very objective and far away distant you know, uh, we stand away from the experience. We're not within the experience. And we think you know, politically, we think financially, we think pastorally, we think as uh, uh, people of the 21st century in America, in Australia, in you know, Italy, in Mexico, we think that way. We're, we're not in that situation. If you were, if you were to put yourself in that situation, it is mind blowing. You see this man, you've been following him for three years and everywhere he goes, you just go after him, you follow him and you listen to every single word he, he spoke, right? He observed every sing, single act, everything, behaviors, and you just observe and you want to imitate, you want him to be your Lord, you want him to be your savior and the king and everything else. And then suddenly he was gone. Now, 
that was a shock, tremendous shock. Now, the other shock is that he came back. It's unbelievable. And it happened. Okay? Now, the problem was is, you read the, the, the reading from Luke, right? Um, the Exodus Apostle, I'll read to you again. Now, look at this. I'll read for you, okay? Um, in the first book, Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus did and taught until the day he was taken up. Did, taught, and taken up, right? right? After giving instruction in the Holy Spirit through those, to the apostles whom he had chosen, presented himself alive to them with many proofs. This is not some kind of a fiction, fictitious story, made up story, make believe, okay? This is a reality, okay? This is a fact, okay? And Luke, you know, he was a scientist, right? A historian. So he said, you have to have proof and many proofs. Okay, after he had suffered, uh, appearing to them for, during 40 days and speak about the kingdom of God. Now, when you talk about proofs, uh, you have to ask the question, what kind of things that will prove to you this kind of reality? What kind of proofs? Of course, you have to have witness and evidence, right? So there is no better evidence than the direct, the direct witness and direct evidence. And you're talking about this man who died already, okay, buried already, pierced through the heart, dead, impossible to be alive. And the evidence is he himself came back. Now, one person could say that, okay, he came back, like Mary Magdalene and you're just a woman. We don't believe you and you have, you're you know, a reputed woman. So, and then you have other women and you have Peter and you have James and have you the 11 and you have 72 uh, disciples and 500 people, men, his disciples, witness, he appeared to them. Okay? So you have so many witnesses of not just his, his appearance, but his presence, his real presence to them as a risen, living, walking, okay, speaking, okay, eating, okay, drinking, cooking, human being, a risen human being. Dead but risen. So those are the proofs. Overwhelming proofs, right? Right? So this is a problem. And he was preparing them to accept this reality of the resurrection. But he gave them only 40 days to accept this reality of the resurrection. 40 days meeting with him. Touching him. Even piercing his heart with the, the hand and the finger. Remember? Thomas, right? It's mind blowing. 40 days. 40 days. Now, when you read the gospel, this is the end of the 40 days. He keeps telling them, okay, go meet with me, go meet with me it's on this mountain top, right? And you read it again carefully from the biblical, not political, pastoral, or uh, financial, spiritual perspective. We're talking from the biblical. So uh, I'll read it to you again, pay attention. Okay, close attention. The 11 disciples went to Galilee. Okay, number one, went to Galilee. Mm -hmm. The location is quite different from other reading. Okay, Matthew was saying from Galilee. Okay. To the mountain, location, mountain. Galilee is the location, the city, the town. Mountain, okay, on top, location, where it is, mountain top. Very specific, right? You see, you have the location, right? Space, still in space. Order them, okay, he had, he had ordered them, okay? That's number one. Go to uh, Galilee Mountain, okay? And when they saw him, interesting, they worshipped him. What do you do as a, as a Jews or Israelite, uh, or Muslims or Arabs, or even, you know, Asians, when we worship somebody, you bow down, you lay prostrate. You kiss their feet. In India, they do that. You, you know, Catholics and Protestant Christians, we don't do that a, a lot. Except if you go to Padma, you go to, uh, you know, Europe, European countries. Americans, we don't, we don't bow to anybody. <laughs> That's the problem. They bow, they worship, 
at his feet. Okay, but then it is so honest, and so I mean, Matthew was so honest to the point that it's embarrassing. They saw him. He told them to meet with him in Galilee on the mountain top. They saw him. They knew that he was, you know, the risen Lord. He conquered death already. That's why they bow down. They worship him as Lord. But still, some doubted. Hmm. In the Greek, it is not they. Okay? A few, not a few, just several doubted. So 11 went to the mountain top, right? That is, there are many, but we see a few or several. So that not all doubted, but, and then Matthew was writing this. How did he know that they doubted? Who doubted? That doubted what? Doubt what? Have you ever thought of that word? Doubted. They saw Jesus, risen Lord, okay? There's no way you can doubt, but still they doubted. What were they doubting? Hmm. So those are the questions you have to ask, like um, Maria. Uh, I mean, you raised the question. Maria. Was he transfigured, like, like in his glory? No, no. They were maybe doesn't it, doesn't have no no. It doesn't say it. You see, the law of reading the Bible is this: we do not put into it what is not there. Okay. Okay. It never say transfigured at all. Oh, he he he's risen. And you know, even if, even when he is not transfigured, this man you saw him, you buried him in a cemetery. He was dead, really dead. And now he's risen. He's you know, he's no longer in the tomb, not in the cemetery, and he's there in your home. That's shocking. He travels everywhere and he eats with you, he even cooks for you. No need to be transfigured. Okay. So you have to ask the question, what does it mean to doubt? Now, the problem with, uh, with uh, the Catholic, you know, we're thinking this is why I say, all oh, the Catholic assumptions, we have to blast it uh, away. Uh, we are afraid of uh, doubting. It is as if there is a taboo or something, and then you doubt and you're, you're a terrible person or you're wicked, you're evil, you don't believe. Does it mean when you doubt something, you don't believe? Not necessary. Right? So you have to obey, believe, believe, you believe in the gospel, you believe, and uh, you have faith, you'll be saved, and you don't have faith, you're sinful. Now, you understand, you have to understand the word doubt. There are two kinds of doubt. Okay? And a subjective doubt and an objective doubt. The subjective doubt is the doubt that kills, that creates war. Okay? That creates all kinds of atrocity, violence, and war. You go back to the beginning of humanity, of history, of the history of humankind. Every time you have war or killing, there's always doubt. Every time you have sin, you know before it, there's doubt. It's called subjective. And you know it because Eve was doubting God. Wasn't she? The devil say, the serpent, whether the devil or not, okay? Oh, he was not telling the truth. He was lying. He's afraid that gonna be, you're going to be like God when you eat the forbidden fruit, right? Forbidden fruit. Doubt, right? That kind of doubt is destructive. But there's another kind of doubt. I call it subjective. It's the foundation of science. You doubt in order to find the truth. Okay? So, as Catholic, we think, yes, um, Denise. Okay, I just heard you say that subjective is the doubt that kills. And then yeah. I thought you said subjective is the... Objective, objective. Objective. The objective doubt. Yeah, not subjective, sorry. Okay, if, uh, correct me when I'm wrong, okay? Well, I, I just, correct it. Okay, so which one is which? Yeah, when you have a subjective... Okay, uh -huh. subjective doubt is fear. 
basically what it is is fear. Fear. Okay. Okay. It is like phobia, unreasonable doubt. Fear is phobia, unreasonable. Okay? okay. But the objective one, the objective doubt is the foundation of science. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So let's go into that. All right. Just correct. Stop me anytime. Okay. When when something is unclear, I speak quick. Okay. So this is called the healthy doubt. Now. What is this experience? You've been spending 40 days with this man who died, who rose from the dead, and his body still have all the wounds, right? He did not heal himself. He did not want to heal himself. He still left, you know, the open heart, right? Intact. The tears start intact, and his hands, his feet still there, okay, with the wounds, the stigmata. Still, he ate, and he cooked. He walked around, you know, he passed the walls, okay? So, you ask yourself, what were they doubting? And who were, who were those people? Okay, so you ask yourself that question. And this is what is gonna happen, okay? Now, I've been, uh, uh, I've been telling this, saying this. A lot of people, we are afraid that, uh, to say that I doubted. And we're afraid that people will condemn you because you don't believe me. You see, the immediate implication is that I don't trust you, I don't believe you when you say I doubt it, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that this is not necessarily mean uh, mean you you don't trust the person. Say I trust Mary Jo, I trust Olivia, I trust Anne, I trust Marilda. Sometimes, right? I trust you. I trust what you say. I trust that what you say. You believe what you say. But sometimes I doubt myself. Isn't it? Has this ever occurred to you ever? Well, you ate breakfast already. But then in the middle of the day, oh, I don't know. I wonder if I had breakfast. I don't know if you had that kind of experience. And I ate, and then sometimes, oh, I don't know if I ate. Huh? You, you do that? See, you don't trust yourself. <laughs> Isn't it? So, okay, I said the rosary, but I don't know if I said the rosary. Okay? And sometimes you forget. So you, see, when this kind of objective now comes to you, you ask the question in order to know because something is, number one, something is unclear. And you are unsure about it. It may mean you don't trust, you know, but you're not saying that I, that I don't trust you, I don't trust your experience, but I don't trust my experience. Okay? Have you ever said something, I couldn't believe it, I passed the test. What, what? I cannot hear you. Couldn't believe it. I can. I cannot hear you say anything because all of you are mute. Yes. Okay. Now, <laughs> many <over> times. Ephrata, <laughs> Ephrata, now you could speak, <laughs> isn't it? When you pass the test, yeah. Oh, I couldn't believe it. Really, unbelievable, huh? So that kind of is unbelievable. Now they're, they're still incredulous because you know. He died. 40 days we spent with him, but we doubt because we couldn't believe it. He died. And then he's now here on the mountaintop speaking to us. We doubt it. Is it true? You know, am I dreaming? You say that? Mm -hmm. Am I dreaming? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of doubt. Mm -hmm. Because it's, the reality is so, so bright. Okay? The reality is so so glorious that you cannot believe your eyes. It's mind-blowing. Reason cannot grasp it. It's not like lack of evidence. It's too much evidence. You doubt it that way. You see that? I've been spending like, like 15 minutes, 15 minutes on the word doubts with you. Hmm. That, that means there's more. <laughs> on the scripture. It's called studying the Bible, okay? With the Bible, okay? Not being political. We're going to get to the, the part, political part later. Now, so I, I give you some reasons for objective doubt. First of all, because oh, you can say, I don't, I don't trust you, I don't believe you because I've been living with you for a while and know what of you say is not true and you never prove you, you know, uh, you make a promise, you never keep the promise, right? I don't trust you. You can say that, I doubt it, right? You have experience, right? even among, you know, uh, family members, you do that. 
But now this is one you trust, right? You trust. But then it's overwhelming. And then so you say, I am so unsure. Uh, it's unclear. I'm confused. Okay, I'm confused. So I want to find out. Okay, so I want to find out because um, uh, I know, but I don't know enough. I know, but I don't, I don't understand what I know. I know it's true, but I don't understand it. See, those are the reasons. Unclear, unsure, unknown. I'm ignorant still, right? And I, you know, when I was in Vietnam, I said, okay, America. Okay, I know America exists. The U.S. of A exists. And then when I went to Canada, and when I went to the U.S. of A, oh, unbelievable, I'm in America. Mm -hmm. The land of the free, right? I'm still unbelievable. What is it? You cannot grasp it. You say, yeah, you, you, you watch TV and you read history and all those things until you live in America. And then, okay, this is different from what I think I knew, right? So I, I don't know a lot. I know a little bit. And then you have to discover more, right? So mm -hmm. unclear, uh, unsure, unknown, okay? Not understand, not understanding. And those are... These are the question. Whenever you hear the word doubt, it implies there are questions. I'm questioning it. And as the, the model of, uh, of uh, Papa, question everything mm -hmm. without mercy. <laughs> Doubting is questioning. It's the foundation of scientific knowledge. Now, this is a blessed doubt. This is a healthy doubt. And this is included in the gospel is the good news imagine this doubting is the gospel of the lord wow have you ever thought of that <laughs> the good news you see after the reading you know the proclamation of this gospel you say the gospel of the lord and you say praise you lord jesus christ and these apostles this particular apostle doubted the resurrection Doubting the resurrection is the gospel. Have you ever thought about that? You look confused, Anne. Are you confused? Yes. Well, yeah, the Lord even allows you to doubt mm -hmm. the resurrection. See, you can hear people say about the resurrection, it means it is a question, it challenges you to go find out for yourself. Is it true? For the 500 apostles and their disciples, and they even laid down their lives for, for, you know, for the resurrection, right? But for you, so there's an opening for you. The Lord doesn't shut down completely. It's open-ended, right? So mm -hmm. it is no longer just, okay, me, and because the church believes, everybody believes, uh, the family believes, right? So how about you? You will find out for yourself. He allows doubter to be among those who are, were on the mountain top <laughs> before he, you know, ascended. He still allows it. That means he respects your free will. Mm. That's love. You know? So that means when you believe, it is a choice you make. You may doubt, but you can make a choice, okay? Now the Lord died, is risen, okay? And that is a fact. People give evidence, right? You could choose to believe it, or you can choose not to. Just like Eve, the Lord said, okay, don't eat that fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And you know, he said the truth. He spoke the truth. You could choose to obey him you could choose to reject him and you could choose to listen to the devil you see that one so still your choice salvation belongs to you the lord gives you salvation already he gives himself to you right so we uh, we get that part okay now what were they doubting we're talking about the word doubt, okay? In the archaic uh, meaning of the word doubt, it means fear, okay? I doubt not, I fear. I doubt, I fear that uh, something is wrong gonna happen, okay? When, you, when the word doubt has uh, the meaning, implication of fear, 
implication of uh, unreasonable fear, uh, or the implication of uh, not knowing, uh, being agnostic, okay, ignorance, right? Uh, the uh, implication of um, of uh, not sure, not being certain, uh, confused, okay, unclear, all those things. So, so all of those meanings. So we don't take one meaning, okay? And as Catholic, we embrace all. Ka, ta, lo, likos, right? So throughout the whole, okay? Likos means the whole, throughout the whole, okay? So negative, positive, we, we don't dismiss it. We live all of them, okay? All right? So what were they doubting? Now, the point, the object of their doubt, was it Jesus? Yeah, maybe. They were doubting themselves because the mind could not grasp it. But the point was all about life. The whole point of incarnation, okay? The proclamation of the good news, the passion, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ascension, and the descent of the Holy Spirit is all about life. This whole thing is all about life. Isn't it? Why? The problem is this. We're living in a dead world. We don't want to die. Because there are many good things we want to continue. People we love. Beautiful things we want to see. New knowledge, discoveries. Okay? And life is really fleeting just like that ocean behind ants back. <laughs> like the waves, you come in and you disperse into nothing. Bubble. Maruda, you see that? Your life just a bubble <laughs> on the beach. You're laughing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I keep telling, you know, in Richmond, you see the Brazil Rio, you know, the, the Brazil de Rio. So you see the river flowing right into the ocean. Uh, and then whatever you throw into it, right? oh, like that beach, right? So you throw a pebble and you see uh, there was a storm from the storm it strike a branch and it, it fell into the, the, the river. And then in, in a split second, it disappeared. You, nothing, there's no trace anymore. You could throw bricks, you could throw a car into it, a cow into it. And within seconds, it's just the river. Your life in this world, you know, your life, your, your individuality, you know, like you're born into this life, just like uh, that little cow, a little brick, um, even golden brick, okay? And bright a little bit. And you, you drop into the ocean or drop into this river and just make a little splash and it goes back to the river. No trace of you anymore. That's your life. Mm -hmm. And we think we live long. <laughs> we don't. And we say, no, no, I don't want to be a flat, uh, a, you know, just a, a blast or you know, just a splash, you know, like that, a splash of water. I want to extend it. And that, that's why I reach up to heaven and look into heaven and see the stars. They want to go to, to the moon and go to the Mars and go to outside the solar system. The mind still wants to know and the, the, the heart will still want to love and to be loved and to be known, to be understood. That, de that desire, that yearning is infinite. But this body, the life in this body is so limited. This is, this is a deep question. Mm -hmm. It's all about life. And you have to ask yourself, what is life? Okay? All religions and science and, you know, leaders of religion, leaders of the world, political leaders, they always promise you life and liberty and whatever. Happiness, isn't it? Life, liberty, and happiness. Pursuit of happiness. Okay. Isn't it? Yeah? They promise you that and even you are in the communist heaven, paradise, utopia, or, you know, Nazi or fascist, uh, you know, heaven, or even capitalist heaven. Everybody promises you something. 
any kind of politicians and talking politics now they got they, they want power to give you happiness in california right now oh you work for me i'll give you the freedom to take free marijuana <laughs> make you happy huh? drugs free canada huh? so people like to be happy huh? oh like you have life and freedom and the promise is a promise but is the promise kept can it be kept can any human being truly really give you life freedom and happiness yes or no could any king queens tyrants president governors mayors politician anybody billionaires can anybody anybody give you life liberty and happiness yeah. any religious leaders founder anyone could you give you that one Yeah. So it's very, very, very important question. Serious question. We need to think. What is life? Hmm. So we don't know our time, are we? I give you this one. Okay. So think about it. And this is what uh, the Lord uh, wanted us to do. Go make disciples. Like that is number one. The mission of Papa. Right. Mm -hmm. Prayer for priest. Right. Priest always prayer. Right. Prayer. Prayer apostolate. Make disciple is not. It, it, we don't say. Never. Jesus said, "Go evangelize." Never said that. He said, "Go make disciples." Okay. Make sure we know our mission. And the, the mission of Papa is taken is derived from this reading Matthew, the last you know last part of Matthew. Jesus said, "Go make make disciples of all nations." Okay, not one nation. Okay, you could make uh, some Australian a uh, Papa member. <laughs> you could make anybody. Make them. It's not like oh, I'm gonna evangelize. I'm gonna share with you the gospel. I'm gonna give you witness. No, make them. Mm. Make disciples, and we're not making them Christians. Very specific. He was particular. Make them my disciples. Different, right? You could be a Christian, you could be a Catholic, but you are not a disciple of Jesus. You could be. Many people claim themselves, "Oh, I'm Catholic, right?" And I pray every day, but still, well, when it comes to the teaching of Jesus, "Thou shall not kill, thou shall not murder, thou shall cannot, uh, thou shall not commit uh, fornication or adultery." Well, it's okay. Some politicians say, "Okay, it's private thing." You know, politically speaking, I believe in this way, but religion, I'll give back to the Lord. Okay, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Render to the Lord what the Lord. Separation of state and uh, church, church and state. Huh? But those are not really, really follower disciples of Jesus. Many people are not baptized. Okay, they are unbaptized, but they follow Jesus. They follow the way and the walk, okay, and the teaching of Jesus. The disciples. Okay, so before you could call yourself or allow yourself to be called Christian or in the 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 people of Christ, okay, be a disciple first. Then we we will not run into the problem of making Christians. This is the reason Papa would have people who are non-Christian praying for priests, and you have to ask yourself: Are they Catholic priests who are not disciples? Are bishops who are not disciples Jesus Jesus Christ? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Are they? Well, we don't know. We cannot pass judgment on anybody, but we have to raise the question. You know, question ourselves: Am I? I'm not asking other people. Am I a follower or disciple, a student of Jesus Christ? Okay. Now we are doing this. We are studying. That means we are students. We are, you know, sitting together, zooming and studying Jesus, the Word of God, right? So He's telling us make disciples, and we are making ourselves disciples by, you know, sitting, you know, at His foot, maybe at the foot of a cross, maybe at the foot of the mountain, the mountain top. Right? 
and then we let him make us his disciples. Where's Gertrude? Oh, she, she had to leave to let the dog people take care of her dog. It's very important. Okay, very important. Uh, taking had to take care of the dogs. Okay, and uh, Maruda's smiling. Where you smiling? All right. So. Um, Disciples of Jesus means the disciples of the risen life. Right? You have life. You have death. You have the risen life. And you have eternal life. Right? So now we get back to the mentality. There are two ways to look at the world. Two kinds of mentality. The worldly mentality and the otherworldly or perhaps the Jesus mentality or the risen Lord's mentality. Okay. So the worldly mentality is this. You are born, you grow up old, you get sick, you die. The end of this life is death. You're born to die. Okay. That's religion for you in general, Buddhism in particular. Okay. And everybody sees that whether you believe in, you're following any kind of system, believe or not, is that way, okay? Solomon was very, very depressed. You know, he was depressed because I achieved everything in my life. I saw nothing new under the sun. At the end of my life, it's just, you know, I'm the king, I'm the most wise king of all the world. And in the end, you know, I just died like a slave or like an animal because we end up with the same, same fate. And he was depressed. When he wrote uh, Ecclesiastic, huh? depression, there's no hope for him. So you read that, you think Ecclesiastic, okay, there's time for be born to be born, time to, you know, to die, time, oh, time for everything, right? But in the end, you know, it's just a depressing, depressive uh, uh, you know, statement. There's no hope. But for Catholic, we begin with death. We don't begin with this life. We begin with the death of Jesus Christ. And then I baptize him to his death, and he is risen. I'm risen with the Lord, and then life. Life, death, okay? And risen life, eternal life. So we start with the death of Jesus Christ, risen life, and eternal life, okay? So we have to ask ourselves, what is life? Okay, that is very, a very serious question we need to explore. And I have a lot to, uh, to teach. However, I think we run out of time. <laughs> you wanted to continue on with uh, this question about what is life? Yes. Okay. No, not, not now because it's too long already. Yeah. <laughs> right hand. I, I promise you um, uh, to respond to that single question. Okay, uh, Mary Cho. No, sorry, Father. I thought you wanted okay. us to raise no, our hands. <laughs> uh, no, no, the, the right hand, the meaning of the right hand, okay? Uh, somebody, uh, you know, um, raised that question and brought it up. And then the, uh, the meaning of looking up into heaven. Oh, yeah. Okay, those are interesting, um, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, idea, topic, or things we need to, to think about. Now, yes, uh, Denise? So you mentioned about looking up into heaven. But uh, I have written here that um, Pope Benedict wrote that ascension, it's, it's false to think of the ascension as a temporary absence of Christ from the world. Rather, we go to heaven to the extent that we go to Jesus Christ and enter into him. Heaven is a person, Jesus himself is what we call heaven. So when uh, you said look up to heaven, I mean, is, mm -hmm. is that context the same as the context that you're talking about? Well, Pope Benedict is a very, very profound uh, theologian. Uh -huh. So whatever he writes, you have to put in a proper context. Okay? Okay. His kind of a theology, there are so many types of theology or branch of schools of theology. Okay, So it, it makes a lot of sense, but Let's go down to earth, okay? Get back down to earth and to the Bible, okay? So we'll address that, uh, that question now. So imagine 
the apostles, the eleven, went up on the mountain top, and Jesus. Well, they worshipped him, and bowed down, worshipped him, and some doubt. Okay, maybe Matthew was the doubter, because he was the one who wrote, right? He just, you know, how do you know the other one doubt all as he he did? But see, he doubt, he wrote it, right? So maybe he was writing his own doubt, but doubting in order to what's next? So what? And uh, now what? Right? So mm -hmm. now, uh, you know, so the question is, now what? See, okay, Jesus reason. Now what? That's why. Uh, that's why I say, okay, Lord, when are you gonna, you know, get back the the kingdom? Okay, uh, take back the kingdom. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and then if that is not the case, and now what? So doubting about Jesus whether he's. So you ask the question, and then suddenly you say, okay, all the powers on uh, heaven and earth is you know given to me. And go make disciples, baptize them in the name of Father and Son, Holy Spirit. Teach them whatever I taught you, right? And then he lifted it up. All right. And we imagine immediately all those of those, uh, you know, space shuttle and the rockets. And uh, we, I think today we just uh, shoot up in the sky another, you know, shuttle. And it's reasonable now, Resu uh, like uh, reasonable, usable now. Okay, it's recyclable mm -hmm. now. So you shoot it up and you come back and you and then you take it back and you you know up and down. So you imagine that it's just shooting up, 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 up into the atmosphere, and you split, you know, the rockets in the into you know kind of different sections and it comes back down, right? It disappears into thin air, into the atmosphere, into space. You imagine that. So Jesus went up. And then the cloud covered his feet. You saw his feet. No more. Where is he? The question is the ascension, right? You see, Jesus ascended into heaven. Jesus ascended into heaven. You have to ask the question, who is Jesus, Lord? What does it mean to ascend? And what is heaven? Three questions, three words. Okay? And when you say ascend, it means you're going up. What is up? What is down? Okay. You have to ask that question now. When we ask those questions, we still ask, we are asking it in the this world, you know, in the sense of space and time continuum. Physical world. Okay. We're thinking in the physical world. Scientific means you know, physical, everything, just physics. The material world. So in this material world, you have space and time, where and when, okay? So you ask the question of a very specific, very particular question, where did he go? Where's up? Where is up? Okay? But when you get into the person of Jesus Christ, time and space exploded because his reality, the reality of his resurrection explodes all the categories of human reality. Okay? He's beyond space and time. So there's no up and down, east and west, or inside and outside. It's totally, completely new reality. Does mm -hmm. it make sense to anybody? Yeah. Yeah. If you are still, still thinking in this way, materialistic, physical reality and we have to find out where's heaven where's hell well, i'll tell you where's hell the very moment you commit mortal sins that's hell you don't have to wait until you die and you go to hell the moment you eat the forbidden forbidden fruit you already cut yourself you know you cut your root from god you're in hell already you know it and Adam and Eve immediately knew it. They were ashamed. They knew it. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to wait, okay? And see, for, for Catholic, we say, okay, well, you, you live a good life, this life, you do some charitable work, give money, donate to the church, and the poor, feed all those good. And then you go to heaven, and you see the angels and God, the Lord will put you on the side of the sheep or the goat, and then you got the punishment or the judgment, and then the yeah, reward, right? And then heaven and hell, that's very, very, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, biblical, but metaphorical, okay? 
But we, we reach a point when we have to ask the question, what is hell real? What is the reality of hell? It's, it's really when we do something evil and we wish evil, we intend evil and we do evil. Okay, that's hell already. No need, there's no need to wait until you die. Huh? So we, we grow into maturity. So are you sleepy, uh, Olivia? <laughs> no. All right. You just keep nodding your head and. Oh no no no! I, I, I'm a father. <laughs> Sit in one spot for a long time. <laughs> okay, I know. Yeah. So no, that's... I, I don't get tired when I I, I talk Jesus. Okay, I talk about Jesus. So no, reality. Okay. Very good. So you ask the question: What is up and down? Okay, and the question is where, you know, ascension in the exact location, Jesus said, on the mountaintop in Galilee, according to Matthew, right? And there's another, play, uh, another place in Jerusalem. Jesus, you know, uh, ascended into heaven uh, in Jerusalem. So we don't know. Uh, location is confusing, okay? So whose report will I believe? But the question is, where is Jesus? So we know this. Jesus said, by his word, using the Bible to explain the Bible, Jesus keeps saying before, you know, the end, he said, okay, I'm going to go back to my father's house. Remember? Mm -hmm. Right? So ascending means he's going back to his father. Mm -hmm. Okay? He doesn't need to be given, you know, any kind of power. He's just going back to who he was or who he is. He's already is. Did he leave heaven? He never left heaven. What he, you know, he incarnated. And when he goes into heaven, you know, he ascended. He never left earth. It just goes back to his father. Remember? So that's heaven. Where the father is, that's where he is. And he keep telling, you know, during the, his uh, teaching on, you know, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to go back to father. There's many mentioned of many rooms in my father's house. And I'm going to prepare rooms for you. I'm going to come back and take you with me. And I wonder, wherever I am, you shall be with me. Remember? So ascending means he's going back to his father. Okay. Now you have to you have to ask the question while we're going to heaven. Heaven is where our father who art in heaven. There's no father. There's no heaven. Wherever the father dwells or resides, there's heaven, isn't it? So he's going to his father. Ascending means going to the father. And then you have sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Ah. The right hand. What does it mean? The right hand. Um, this is the the question raised by I think uh, either uh, Maria or who is that? The right hand. Uh, and the right hand is this. Left hands for the you know the Old Testament, the you know, the Hebrews Testament, the culture. It means a useless hand. Useless. So, and so when you slap people with the left hand, you know, you, you, you tell people you're useless. The right hand is a useful hand. You make things with the right hand. Strong hand, useful, strength, okay? You use the hand to bless as well. Right hand of the Father. Of course, strong is power, authority, dominion, everything under his feet. Power, scepter. Huh? You see the right hand? At the right hand of God the Father. That means he's the scepter. He is the power of God. Okay? He's everything that is. He's in charge of you use the bishop here said use the word sovereign, sovereignty, like kingly, right? Like an emperor. Huh? But you, know, we, you have the word king and you have the word emperor and you need me think about oppression and all those things and negative things. But you know, this man, this God man, he already served himself up. He served himself literally up for the people. And his power is the power of service, the power of his, his heart, the mercy huh, of God. So he goes there to the Father and, then other, and the sitting at the right hand of God the Father Okay, and now when you think about ascending into the Father of Heaven, okay, you have to think about the word 
we are reality of Father. What happened? Somebody called me. It's a time to stop, but I'm going to end this uh, with this note. Father <laughs> means, fathers means protection. Father, fathers, papa, papa, protection. Okay. Mm -hmm. Safety, security. You have food, you have warmth, you have family, you have love, and you have discipline, you have teaching. The father is going to love you, but he's going to push you away so you could be strong on your own. He's going to push you away with this left hand, useless hand, so you'll be you stand on your two feet. He's going to embrace you with his right hand, the strong hand. That's the teaching on the father, fatherhood. Huh? It's going to raise not just your, you know, your physical being, well-being. It's going to raise you in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit. It's going to help you, educate you, inform you, make you into mature, mature, are the Christ and are the Christ. Okay? So that's the father for you. That's Papa. And I and with so ultimately conclusion if you want to ascend to heaven join papa <laughs> you agree marilda i do father thank you thank you <laughs> okay glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now yes. And ever shall be world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you all. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for